Welcome to The Sandbox with Justin Peters, connecting you to the ideas and tools to improve your life. Now let's go. Hello and welcome into The Sandbox. I'm your host, Justin Peters, and I'm excited for today's conversation because we are talking all things leadership. Joining me in that conversation is today's guest, Steve Gillen. Steve is a good friend of mine who I had a privilege of working with for over seven years, where I got to see firsthand his people-centric leadership style. Steve is an executive at Marshall McLennan Agency in St. Louis, where he has over 35 years of management and leadership experience. In today's conversation, Steve and I discuss his thoughts on how to become a better leader, three questions to ask yourself when addressing performance issues on your team, and how to gain trust with senior leaders. This conversation is perfect for those emerging leaders that want to be seen as more than just a supervisor. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Steve Gillen. Hey, Steve, welcome into the sandbox. All right, thank you for having me, Justin. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about our conversation today. I want us to center most of our conversation around leadership. Um, my audience, the 20-something, I think this is a critical topic for them as most of them are probably starting maybe their first management positions or you know, aspiring to be a leader at some point in time in their near future. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of, you know, everybody's got a little bit different take, I think, on leadership. And I think it's important for anyone that is excited to be a leader that um, you look to those people that you think are um, doing a great job as leaders and try to dissect some of their thoughts and, and how they got to where they were. So I'm hoping that's the conversation that we have today, but I've already mentioned a couple words and maybe we start with a few definitions. Um, so manager versus leader. So I, I'm interested, do you, in your, in your mind, do you have, uh, do you believe that there's a difference between management and leadership? And if so, what is that? Yeah, I, I, I think there is a distinction, Justin. Um, and that's not to say that managers uh, cannot be viewed as, as having leadership qualities or leadership roles. It, it may be uh, uh, a matter of degree to some extent, but I would view it from the standpoint of uh, when we talk about leadership and leaders, uh, there's some things that come to mind, at least from my perspective, that tend to uh, maybe differentiate uh, between the leadership role and what we, we look at as maybe more of a management role. And so when I think about leadership, I think about leaders who, uh, in my estimation, have to have a vision uh, mm -hmm. for what they want to see uh, uh, in terms of the organization, where they want to go, um, how are they going to get there, and it's, it's a long-term view of what you want to accomplish. So, you know, whether you're making widgets or you're in a sales and service organization or whatever it may be, whatever the overarching goal is for that organization, being it growth, uh, profitability, whatever it is, then in my estimation, the leader has to develop that vision, that strategy for how you're going to get there, which may encompass uh, any number of things. And so, uh, in addition to that, you're not a leader if you don't have followers. Mm. And uh, so, how do you how do you accomplish that, and how do you um, bring those people along to help you uh, accomplish what it is uh, that you've laid out as your vision, if you will? And so that's part of the challenge and expectation, I think, for, uh, for leaders as well. Uh, I think leaders are teachers and preachers, and, and I've, I've said that for a, a very long time in terms of uh, if we're going to have a vision, then how do we convey that effectively to the people who we want to embrace it and execute on it? And so uh, we have to know it, we have to teach it, we have to preach it, and be at the front of the room and be able to, uh, to communicate that uh, that effort effectively. Mm. So we want, So when we look at a management role, I view that probably more as here's the manager uh, I've been given, if I'm the manager, I've been given the rules, uh, the guidelines, the expectations, and now it's my job to execute on those. And it's more of a day-to-day -day kind of scenario where I have accountability for people, I need to keep the trains on time, I need to keep the ship afloat, and I need to execute, in essence, on the vision and the strategy that's been given to me. So that, that to me, is kind of more of the distinction between the leadership role and, say, the management role. Mm -hmm. uh, and managers can be leaders for their people, but they really need to be at the front of the, uh, the line in terms of that day-to-day -day execution 
and making sure that we're accomplishing what we want to do and really executing that strategy. So hopefully that makes some sense in terms of what I see is the difference between maybe more of a leadership role and say a day-to-day -day management role. Sure. Yeah, I think I think that really lays a good framework for what's uh, got to come up in this conversation. Especially, you you made a lot of good distinctions there. Um, but maybe let's let let's uh, before we jump into that, let's talk a little bit about your history. Uh, could you give us like a a brief overview of your career um, and your you know you as a leader and a manager throughout your career? and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Um, well, I started a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the business for 43 years. Um, and I really, really originally started out as wanting to be a, a teacher. Uh, and I got my degree uh, in education. I got my bachelor's degree, and then I got my master's degree in education. Um, and I thought I was going to be the next great basketball coach and make millions of dollars and, and, but that didn't work out so uh, so like many people in my generation I, I kind of backed into uh, the insurance industry uh, because I had a salary and I had a company car and, and so it was just kind of okay sounds good let's do it and I had a bit of a background in consulting and whatever for the carrier side and so that's where I started uh, with Transamerica Insurance and then um, uh, progressed in my career, uh, ultimately became a manager uh, in that department, moved to St. Louis, and I was there, I think, 13 years. Uh, and that's really, really where I, I cut my teeth in the industry. Hmm. And uh, at that time, carrier or organizations really took the time to, to teach uh, insurance, if you will, which has kind of gone by the wayside more recently. Uh, from there, I went to... Uh, uh, a large brokerage house, uh, Sedgwick, uh, and uh, performed consulting roles for primarily healthcare at the time. Spent about three years there. Uh, from there, uh, my uh, one of my clients hired me <laughs> to come in and be a director uh, uh, for loss control and workers' compensation in, in the healthcare system. Uh, in that role, uh, I progressed to ultimately becoming the corporate risk manager uh, for the healthcare system. And spent about 10 years there. And then uh, leaving there, I came to my present role in Terrell as, um, as uh, doing primarily consulting, uh, but ultimately ascended to where I am now in the practice leader for business insurance um, with 80 some people that I'm responsible for right now. So uh, that's kind of a quick snapshot. Yeah. My so you have um, essentially you you lead a group of eighty people. When did you uh, wh when did you first start leading people or managing people? What part of your career was that? Overall, it would have been back in uh, early days with uh, Trans American Insurance Company when I managed the department or took over. Okay. Uh, managing department back then. So that was <laughs> that was back in the late eighties, early nineties. So you have, you know, roughly 35 years of like leadership or management experience right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's okay. true. There are various stages, but yeah. Yeah. What, uh, you know, how would your employees describe your leadership style? Everybody's got a little bit different style. And that's, I think that's the complicated thing about um, leadership is that there's multiple ways to do it right. Uh, but I'm interested, you know, what, how would um, your employees describe your general style? Uh, the cranky old man, maybe. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, well, I, I hope they would view it as um, one who's uh, engaging, uh, and I mentioned empowering, mm -hmm. uh, that values their uh, input, and I, and I think I've uh, held true to that. Uh, I keep my door open. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have an open door policy, and and. Uh, I'll make time for anybody who wants to come in and talk and, and, and people have done that. And so I appreciate that. It, it's sometimes hard for leaders to do. And sometimes you have to close your door once in a while, but I really try to, as best I can, um, keep that door open and, and make myself accessible. And I think that's very important. And I need to work on being more accessible and visible, I think, on the floor sometimes because we get caught up uh in what we're doing but and even in this pandemic i think it's even more important that we're uh, as leaders accessible to our folks 
So I hope that's a view that people have of me in terms of being accessible, uh, being a, a resource, being there when they, uh, they need me, and also providing some direction and guidance and expectation for how we're gonna accomplish our job. Yeah, so you, you mentioned a lot of qualities that, that you know, knowing you too, I totally agree with a lot of things in terms of fairness, the open door policy, um, you know, empowerment is big for you as well. I, I never felt like you were much of a micromanager. Um, but, you know, was there, you know, and it's cool to see that you also have some awareness that there's still some things that you want to work on. I mean, you're plus 65 years old now, uh, and you still want to grow and develop. <laughs> <laughs> and you still want to grow and develop as a leader, which is really cool. Um, do you feel, you know, what is, was there a major part of your leadership style that's maybe changed since the beginning, um, you know, back whenever you first uh, started leading people? Yeah, I think so. Um, when I think about that, there's, um, when I first started, sometimes you're, you're, you're learning by the seat of your pants to some degree. And I think organizationally, in industry in general, and I don't want to make generalized statements, but I think many times we take people who have been very good at their job and suddenly thrust them into a management or supervisory role, leadership role, uh, without any training or background or knowledge and say, here, go do it. Um, and so I think just by virtue of that, sometimes that we learn and grow and probably learn some things and change uh, the way we've done things in the past. And I, and I see that, um, you know, as we grow older and wiser, we get a little more knowledge and, and learn some things and hopefully incorporate them. So uh, for me, I think that's definitely true. And, and, and part of that, probably a distinguishing moment, uh, I think for me is just uh, learning how to communicate effectively with different people and knowing who your audience is. Mm. So when I say that in the past, I might have taken a position, put a stake in the ground <laughs> and said, here's the deal, you know, with not a lot of finesse. And what I believe, if I'm making a decision as a leader, I want to be in a position where I can defend it, feel good about it. Um, and, and, and so if I want to accomplish what I want to accomplish, then I think the messaging becomes even more important in terms of, especially with people who are going to help you get there. Maybe it's my direct report. Maybe it's my boss or bosses. So the conversation on one particular topic may be much different for one person as opposed to another, just based on what I know and how they want to receive information. And I think that's more and more important in today's environment. If you want to navigate the waters and accomplish what it is you want to accomplish, knowing that certain people are going to have to vote for you, and vote for your initiative and how are you going to accomplish that and so that that's, that's the work that needs to be done uh and that's one of the things i think changed for me uh over time and i learned and got better at is really understanding uh who it is uh that i have to have on my side so to speak or to get to where i want to be sometimes it's managing up so managing up means I have to understand what that person wants, what they need in order for them to make a decision and how, can, how best can I make my case. And it can be different for different people, different audiences, depending on who you're, in, who you're talking to. So uh, I think having that knowledge. So for me, I'm very much uh, a data person. I want to see the data. I want to see the information. And so the people surround, uh, that surround me know that because they know I'm going to ask that question. And so when they come to me, they're bringing me the information uh, that's supported by the data. And that's just the way I manage it. And so that's just an example for me. So for me, I have to understand uh, uh, if I'm going to someone that wants it short and sweet, okay, then I'm gonna get it short and sweet. If I'm going to someone who wants more detail, then I'm gonna give them more detail. So I, that was a learning point for me. And I think something that changed over a period of time that helped me get better at accomplishing what it is I wanna accomplish. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. It sounds like uh, over time you've learned how to adapt to people versus having people adapt to you, um, which yeah, I, I think, think is a, a difficult goes, topic. Yeah, yeah, I think it goes both ways a little bit, but we're all human, right? We yeah. all have different approaches. Uh, we've all gone through that kind of training as, as to who we are, what kind of personality we are. And I think the more we can understand that, not only for ourselves, 
uh, but with our colleagues and who we work with. Um, I, I think it helps us, uh, if you know that about someone, uh, it helps us understand where they're coming from, what their motivations are, and how you can, how you can interact, them, interact with them in the most effective way. Okay. So uh, early on and while you were leading people, you know, this might be a meaty question, but like, how did you learn uh, to actually lead people to, to, you know, how, how did you become the leader that you are today? Was there, did you have a mentor that was, you know, reflecting knowledge back to you or, uh, you know, was it just really like get thrown into the fire and learn as we go? What, do you have a, a process for people if they're, you know, starting out and they're, they really want to be a great leader? Uh, is there a way that they can um, at least do that better than just, I'm going to fail and learn from every failure? <laughs> yeah, we hope so anyway, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I think, Justin, for me, it was, it was probably a combination of things. Um, I mentioned my background in, in education. Uh, to me, when I look back, that was that was a great foundation uh, for me that helped me become a better leader, if you will. And not everybody's in that role, but I say that from the standpoint of when I was growing up, I was I was painfully shy and, and withdrawn. Wow. And one of the things I had to work very hard to overcome that in terms of being in the front of the room and communicating with people. And that education degree, even back then where they videotaped your presentation to a class and then you sat down with your professor and critiqued it. What about, tell about an eye-opening experience that was. Uh, I mean, it was horrible. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And hopefully I've gotten a little better over time with that. But I I mentioned that as, as, uh, for me at least, uh, was a great exercise. And I think more, the more people can do that regardless of your role, because we're interacting with people and communicating if you're in a sales role or even with face-to-face contact with people, even if it's one-on-one or if you're in the front of the classroom or whatever it is, having that ability to effectively communicate, I think, is, is going to do nothing but positively impact your ability to lead, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So that was, that was part of it. You mentioned a mentoring role. I think if you talk to a lot of people who have been successful in, mentor, or in leadership, uh, had that one person or person who significantly impacted uh, their career. And, and I was fortunate to have that in, in my career, uh, probably in the 90s when I worked for the healthcare system. Uh, I worked for an individual who had enough faith in me to hire me because I never worked in a hospital, but, but at least knew me enough to uh, give me a chance and support me in that effort. And someone who pushed me outside of my comfort zone, but also someone who could go in and sit down and talk to at any point in time at the end of the day or during the day or beginning of the day and have a conversation about challenges or how should I do this or how to go about it. Uh, And I really view that as a major milestone in my career in terms of helping me uh, learn how to become a better leader a better manager, a better role model for people in in doing that. And and at that time, uh, I was responsible for people, clinical people who who were reporting to me and who were high achievers who were climbing up my back every day. And I had to work hard just to stay even or stay ahead. Hmm. So it it was a challenge for me. Um, And and I'll never forget this, but I, I think the second day on the job or something, uh, my mentor came in, my boss at that time, gave me a small piece of paper and said, handle this. I had no idea what to do necessarily, where to go or what, uh, but I figured it out. And I think that was by design, you know, here, go figure this out and do it. And so uh, that mentoring relationship, I would encourage anyone, if you can, to find that one person that's going to help you in your career and help you grow. Uh, it was certainly true for me. So, um Another thing I think that that helps you learn how to lead is by knowing and doing the work that the people uh, that you're responsible for are doing. And so uh, I always wanted to be in a position to know what they're dealing with. Uh, I, I'm not afraid and never be afraid uh, to roll up my sleeves and do the things that they're doing or need to do or learn how to do. And I think when you're able to do that, you gain a better perspective uh, where they're coming from, 
and how to be a better leader if you understand the challenges that they face. And some of the best way to do that is, is go do the job. Uh, and I'm not saying that across the board in every case, but where you can, understanding the challenges that they face makes you a better leader, I think. So, um, and then luring, I think, how to deal with human beings uh, because we all have different challenges. And I was in a position where uh, it's easier to lead when you have high performers, right? Who are gonna do the job consistently. The greater challenge is helping those uh, who may need help uh, or assistance or, or some guidance or whatever. And, and that's the challenge I think we run into, but an opportunity where I had and learned and was able to do that from a performance review, from helping people understand how to get better at their job. And I think that's an important role for a leader as well. You know, how can you help people realize their full potential in terms of training and education and tools and accountability and so forth. So, um, so, so going back to the piece of paper moment, um, when your boss just slid you the piece of paper, that's uh, interesting, and I'm I'm glad you took it by the horns. But uh, you know, as a leader in your sense now, when how do you recognize the a, a scenario when you need a push, um, maybe a, a manager underneath you or an employee underneath you to grow into a position, and uh, you know, when do you maybe need to manage down and help? guide them so that they don't make a complete fool of themselves handling a situation or, you know, have some, uh, some negative consequences associated with it. Yeah. I, I, I think it kind of goes back to what we said earlier, as far as not just throwing someone into that role without uh, an opportunity to at least learn and have a backstop, if you will. Um, and so we tried to do more of that, I think, with people who are initially, um, thrown into, and I shouldn't say thrown into, have earned the right, have earned the, the, the ability uh, to move into that role, but also uh, have a, a safe environment, if you will, uh, to do the things without, and, and knowing that someone's there is gonna catch them uh, if they make a mistake and, it, and it's okay, and it's okay to make a mistake, that you have someone, and it almost goes to the mentoring relationship, okay, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm gonna do. And you learn from that and then you gain confidence and then you're willing to go on and, and, and do the, the next thing. So mm. I, I think that's an important element uh, in the initial stages of, of, of moving someone into that role is having that transition period where you do have that backstop and that ability to make a mistake and not worry about making a mistake because it's gonna be okay. And I think that's important for people too that they know as their manager, their leader, whoever it is, when they make a mistake, that we're going to be behind you. We're not going to throw you under the bus. We're yeah. going to back you up and help you grow and get better. Everybody's going to make a mistake. You know, everybody didn't get up in the morning and say, you know, today's my day to screw up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that nobody does that intentionally. They're trying as best they can, and people are going to make mistakes, and we become very busy. And, and you think about our environment. How many times are there opportunities for something to go wrong? So we need to nurture that, support it, build a framework for growth where people can feel free to make mistakes, but realize, learn from it, get better, and you have a backstop for that. So hopefully, I, I don't know if that answers your question. But. I, I think it does. I think it does. And um, maybe, you know, similar to that question as well. And I think something I struggle with and I see um, some of my peers, you know, other high potentials that are young that move into leadership roles right from the get-go. Um, I see a big struggle with a lot of them is delegation and it's, it's letting go. They've, they, you talked about, you know, uh, a lot of organizations promote uh, the, the top individual performers and they don't always necessarily succeed in leadership roles. Um, but a lot of times they do as well. They'll figure things out. Uh, but I found something early on in my career that I really struggled with was, was delegation. You know, I had a certain level of expectation for the work that I did. Uh, therefore, I wanna reflect that back on, on the work of the people underneath me. Um, how, and you talked about being a micromanager, not being a micromanager right from the get-go. So maybe it came a little bit easier to you, but do you have any advice around how people can get comfortable with delegation? And, and some of it's in your DNA, I think, to degree sometimes, because 
I know I can do better and I'll just do it and it'll be quicker. Yeah. So that's, that's not the point really sometimes. It's not the fact that you can do it better or quicker. It, it, if, if you're a leader or all, you have to invest in those to help them grow. And by doing it yourself, you're not helping them get better or grow in what they want to do. And sometimes you have to let them fail by through delegation they can learn from. And I don't want to say that from the standpoint of jeopardizing the organization, but if, if here's something I want you to do, if you're not clear, let me know. But you can't accomplish everything you want to do unless you're able to effectively delegate. Mm-hmm. And you effectively delegate by hiring the best people that you can, number one. You want to try to do that, nurture their professional development, help them grow. By virtue of that, you get to the point where I know if I'm going to give something to someone to do, I know they're going to get it done. I know they're going to get it done quickly. I know they're going to get it done in a quality perspective. And so when you get to that point, delegation becomes very easy, right? Uh, In fact, I may have to draw back a little bit because I'm giving... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm giving everything. I said, wait a minute, I have to be fair here. You know, there's some things I need to do and I can't, I can't overload you, but that's the position where you want to get, right? You want to surround yourself with people who you know are going to get the job done. And so if you can do that and nurture that, you get past the point of saying, well, I need to do it myself. If you're constantly saying you need to do it myself, then there's a deeper core issue I think you're, you're dealing with here. And that's the fact, if you don't have confidence in somebody to do the job, well, you need to address that. It's not about it's not about delegation at that point necessarily. It's about performance. If you get the performance in line, then the delegation is going to is going to become much easier. Mm. Okay, um, and then addressing performance, I think that's probably uh, a touchy subject early on for for leaders. They probably um, you know first time leaders probably never necessarily had to deal with performance issues. Um, do you have some general advice on dealing with performance issues, maybe someone's first uh, experience dealing with someone that's not um, not up to par with the standard that needs to be had? Well, people don't like confrontation and they'd rather avoid it. Yep. <laughs> that's what I found, I think, and, and we're all human. Uh, we, we don't particularly enjoy having those difficult conversations and, and over my career, you know, I, yeah, I've, I've, I've had to let a number of people go and it's not a pleasant conversation. It's never easy, you never get comfortable with it. Uh, but sometimes it's the best interest of that person and, and, and the organization. And many times the person realizes it and sometimes they may have that denial, but many times if you're pointing out things where it's just not working, um, I think they realize it and many have gone on to be very successful. It's not that you can't be successful. It's just that in this environment and this expectation, you're going to struggle. And so being able to have that conversation is important, not just for the benefit of, of the organization, but for the benefit of that, that person as well to help them get better somehow. So there's three things that I, I, I tend to ask people in terms of addressing a performance issue. Uh, number one, and we get them all the training that they need in order to be successful. So if there's a knowledge gap somewhere, then we need to address that. Have we given them all the tools that they need, be it technology or whatever it may be, in order for them to be successful in their job? Number three, have we set the expectations for them clearly in terms of what we want them to do? And they have knowledge of what a successful outcome looks like. And so if we've done all three of those things and they're still struggling, then it's time to have that conversation and say, you know what, it's just not working. But it ought to be the absolute last resort in terms of taking away someone's job and their livelihood because you're not only affecting them, but you're affecting their family and and people had nothing to do with this, right? Yeah. So it ought to be the absolute last uh, scenario for anyone uh, to separate from an organization, but at times it, that's the only solution. That's where you're at. But you've exhausted every other opportunity and give them, given them every opportunity to succeed. And I think that's important as an employer. We have to do that. We're not treating you any differently than we would anyone else in that role or setting the expectation any differently than we would anyone else for your group. And so I think those are, those are the things that I would look at consistently 
Uh, if there are barriers to success, then organizationally, how do we remove those so you can be successful? Mm. Sometimes we just need to find a different seat on the bus for them within the organization. Maybe it's not working here, but you know, you can go over here based on your talents and what you want to do and be successful. And we've done that a number of times. So mm -hmm. maybe it's not separation, but maybe it's separation from that job and moving to a different role somehow. So look at all, all those alternatives to try to salvage someone first. Are they salvageable? Ask that first question. Do you think they're salvageable? And if so, how can we, how can we help them be successful? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get to the point where, you know what, it's just not working. They're not happy. And if failure to address that from a performance standpoint, um, that can permeate an organization for someone who's not, who's not showing up or not completing or not fulfilling their job or not doing what they need to do. It can kill morale. And so ignoring it or not addressing, I think is probably one of the biggest mistakes I see from managers allowing that to exist and not addressing it. So. Mm. Uh, hopefully that makes some sense and people no that that was uh, uh that was a really great answer i like the three um the three things you went through and you know taking ownership first is there something that i haven't done to allow this person to succeed uh and if so how can i remove that obstacle and then even going to the fact of like hey maybe it's just not the right seat on the bus for them. Can I move them to a different seat? And then finally, if it has to happen, uh, letting somebody go. I've always really appreciated the fact that you've been a people first leader. Um, I'm reading a book right now, uh, Leaders Eat Last by S Simon Sinek. And he mentions um, the difference between leaders that, that look at their people um, as numbers versus actual people. And some are you know, easily able to you know, cut 800 jobs, uh, especially like this is a very timely conversation in the, you know, like, you know, the pandemic right now, when you look at it as first of like, this is somebody's livelihood, their family might be depending on them. Uh, this is probably the, the worst time to let somebody go, even right. though it might be the worst time for the organization to maintain that payroll. So I've always really appreciated that, that aspect of you. And I wanted to call that to light a little bit. Um, I think that's really important and something that I've learned and gained from you. Uh, you know, you also mentioned uh, surrounding yourself with, with great people and finding the right talent. Uh, so maybe a two-part question here. First, um, is there something that you look for uh, whenever you're recruiting talent in general? And then second, is there something you look for uh, in potential leaders? You know, uh, you know, maybe a characteristic or something that that you identify that you think might lead to success in a potential leader? Yeah, I, th I think, uh, Justin, I, work ethic comes to mind. Uh, I, I guess I, I look for someone who's had experience and, and, and demonstrated uh, that dedication to getting the job done and, and um, uh, shows up for work, puts their head down, does their job. Um, it's very dedicated. It, it, it's, it's a mindset sometimes. And that worth ethic, I think, permeates uh, the organization and can, and, and you see that in different places. So I would put that as, 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 as one of the things that I think is important to look for. Uh, timeliness and quality of work. We talked about it a little bit earlier. I know if I can give somebody something to do, I know it's going to get done. I know it's going to get done in a timely fashion. I know it'll be done well. Uh, honesty, integrity. I mean, it's one of those moral values that we talk about, but it, I think it's so important in, in any organization for how we conduct ourselves. Um, to me, there's no gray area there. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a moral code and an expectation to develop trust and resources um, and, and worthiness with our client that, that goes beyond question. Uh, a commitment to your professional development. Uh, we always have to keep learning. And so someone who's committed to their craft and learning it, but also growing in their profession on a continual basis through certifications or whatever. If I knew nothing about you and I know that you've gone to the effort to increase your knowledge level through a certification, through a designation or whatever, that tends to set you apart. At least you made the effort to do that. Mm -hmm. and I think that's important for clients as well. If we're trying to gain prospects and people who don't know us, how do we evaluate that? How well you've done? What's your experience? Uh, a continuous desire for achievement, I think, is is one that's important. So uh, I'm never done. I want to keep 
moving forward. And I think that's important for leaders as well. We have to keep pushing the envelope. Uh, we're, never, we're never satisfied with the status quo. I've never been satisfied with the status quo. I've never stood still in my career anyway. I've always continued to advance. And I'm always looking for the next step and how we can get better and how we can do that. Uh, so those are the things I'm looking for too. Uh, a competitive fire and a desire to win. Uh, I hate losing. Yep. <laughs> uh, I, I hate losing to my grandkids when we play <laughs> my games. I don't give them any breaks. So uh, maybe that's part of it that's in your DNA, but uh, uh, I, I think it's important in the business world too. And not that you're going to win every battle, but we don't have to feel good about it. And what yeah. did we do wrong or what could we have done better? And how can we get better? So that competitive fire, uh, I think, is important to, uh, to be successful and somewhat I, something I would look for. Uh, positivity. Uh, you have, to, you know, positivity and energy. I, I think when you have that as an individual and, and, and you bring that to an organization, you tend to lift everybody up, too. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's... Uh, it's one of those uh, maybe more difficult things to quantify, but it, I think it's very, very important. So if you're working for an organization um, uh, and you're a leader, by gosh, you better be carrying the banner. Yeah. And then not everything is good, but when you're in the front of the group or in front of the room or whatever, you're representing the organization, that positivity needs to be there. Hmm. Uh, and also a problem solver. If you're coming to me, I'd rather come to, I'd rather uh, you come to me with an answer and not a question, but what do you think the answer is? And, and I, I try to do that with the people I'm going to or my bosses. I don't want to come to them with a question. I want to come to them with an answer. So if we go through all those things, those are the types of things that to me resonate and what I'm looking for with people uh, who are going to fit in that management role, the leadership role and so forth. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. I don't have as much experience being a manager or a leader. Um, so I draw on a lot of my experience of like, what have I really liked about a leader or manager? And a lot of those attributes, it's, it's, it's funny. We are, are a, a mutual friend and, you know, she works for you. I don't work for her anymore, but Amanda Woodall, um, she was my first boss, my, my first manager. Um, and I really looked up to her for a lot of those similar reasons. I, I think at minimum, um, regardless if you don't necessarily have the management tactics yet or uh, certain things, there are manageables for every leader as soon as they step into a role. And that's just setting the tone. It's, it's uh, you know, am I showing up positive to work every day? Am I critically thinking through situations and, and pro trying to problem solve? Am I putting my professional development first? Um, you know, I, I really admired a lot of those things about her. And in turn, um, I saw a manager like that step up and do all those things. I wanted to step up and be the best for her. And I've had managers in the past where I haven't necessarily wanted to work as hard for because I see that they don't work as hard for either. So I think um, that's an easy, you know, I, I think one of the easy things for leaders or managers, uh, new time, new leaders or managers is just being the person that you would want to work for. I think that's, that's the way to, to be a great boss. Yeah, I think so. It, and I, the other thing I would say too, for people uh, want to migrate and, and move into a manager or leadership role, uh, it can be kind of scary. So you think, yeah, I want to do that. Uh, but you also have to realize that the light is going to shine on you more brightly. And people are not going to agree with you. People will take pot shots at you. Uh, and you have to be willing to, to, to take that on. And so uh, you can't ask for it and not be willing to accept that fact that it can be kind of scary. And you're putting yourself out there and realizing that uh, I, I think that's a realization that people need to understand if they're going to assume in that role. Um, so confidence, positivity, uh, faith in what you're doing and understanding of professional growth. If you're doing all those things, uh, you'll be successful and you'll, and you'll wind your way, uh, through those more difficult times when, when everything's easy and get me and I promise you not everything will be easy in your leadership role. You got it. They're going to be difficult times. So. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about uh, difficult times. Do you have an example uh, through your career of maybe a leadership lesson you had to learn the hard way? Yeah, and, and, and you know what, I, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier. I, I think it was uh, me learning how to message 
in a better way. Uh, that was a, I, I would say more of a sentinel event for me that I really learned from. Hmm. Um, and, and it was dealing with uh, colleagues who were my peers, but also uh, uh, who were above me and me taking a stand, which in hindsight, when I look back on, uh, it was really a stake in the ground. And I said, basically told people to go count Sam. So, <laughs> uh, which didn't go over well. Uh, and I wouldn't have changed, I wouldn't have changed what I believed was the right thing, but what I would have changed is the message. And so to me, that was one of those, those, those kind of sentimental events, if you will, that really uh, helped me get better when I, when, when I, in a leadership role and how I communicate that we talked about that, that to me was really probably one of the biggest things. Mm. Um, and you've mentioned it a couple of times now in our conversation about, uh, you know, I don't think a lot of people, I think a lot of people think about management and leadership as managing the people underneath you, uh, but also managing, you know, some of the people above you, or at least having the confidence to, you know, put your stake in the ground. Um, if you need to fight for your employees, fight for your employees, how does, um, a 20 something year old first time manager have the confidence to, to maybe ask for, put a stake in the ground for a, a situation or if it's an employee, they're asking for an employee or something. Do you have any general advice on, on how to deal with a situation like that where they might be speaking to someone that has 35 years of, of leadership experience, um, but in their eyes might be seeing a situation the wrong way? You know, if you feel strongly about a situation, you're taking someone with um, more experience or trying to convince them, I guess, of, of, uh, of that role. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying don't, don't change your, your feelings about what's right and what's important, what do you want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, how, how can I can convey that in a way that I feel strongly about, and, and, and there will be those times uh, if you've uh, nurtured a relationship over a period of time, it's much easier to have those conversations. Mm. And so one of the things I did in, in, in this role when I first started, it wasn't like everybody was going to give me uh, the keys to the car and say, here, go drive it. Mm. You had to develop that trust. Uh, trust is not given, it's earned. And when you can start to develop and nurture those relationships, then it's much easier to have that stake in the ground conversation, if you will, yeah. because you have a very good communication and rapport with the people that, you, that you're that you trying to, to work with, right? So uh, my relationship with my boss has grown over the years. He, you know, he may have looked at me out, out of the corner of his eye initially, but now we look at each other straight on. Yeah. We don't always disagree, but I have no reservations about going in and sitting down and talking and we go back and forth and maybe we don't disagree, but we move forward and it doesn't limit our ability to have a healthy conversation. And I would say that about people uh, I'm surrounded with too. I want their input and I encourage their input. And I think that's part of the important thing for leaders is to have that open door and encourage people to raise their hand uh, rather than saying, well, if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. I, I really want your input and use it. We may not always agree, but I, I, I look for that feedback. So I, I guess in overcoming that, Justin, what I'm trying to say is work very hard to develop the relationship. So I, as an example, I went to all the board members in, in a new role and I said, you know what? I'm probably gonna make some mistakes. In fact, I know I'll make some mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, but I want you to raise your hand or throw the flag when I do or say, Steve, you know, this isn't working because I need your feedback and I need your help. And so nurturing those relationships over a period of time gives you a much better opportunity to put a stake in the ground and say, here's, here's what I'm thinking, here's why. So first of all, develop your champions, develop your relationships, and that conversation becomes much easier in my estimation. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great piece of advice. Um, as we conclude this conversation, Steve, uh, what, what in your eyes do you feel like is maybe the biggest challenge facing leaders today? Gosh, uh, throw a rock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess COVID would be one, right? Yeah. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think right or wrong, many times uh, we're defined as leaders uh, as to how well we, we manage through crisis, I think sometimes. Hmm. Uh, and this this is certainly, COVID has certainly been an example of that, uh, where we're suddenly thrown into an environment where we're not seeing each other. We're remote, we're working remotely. And, and you know what? Uh, we found out some things that we probably wouldn't have found out otherwise had we not been forced in this situation. Hmm. Uh, so we've had to learn somewhat on the fly, make ourselves more accessible than we ever have. I, I would say in many ways, we're communicating, communicating more with the troops now than we did before. Hmm. Uh, in, in many ways, we've been more accessible. We're reaching out more geographically. I mean, we've learned some things because we've been forced to. Uh, and I think people in general feel good about working remotely as long as I'm accessible as long as the leadership is successful and we learn from those things. So uh, I, I think that's really one of the challenges that we face. And we face those uh, throughout a period of time and you will continue. Pandemic now, whatever the crisis is gonna have, 9-11, uh, economic downturn, the crash, whatever it is, somehow you'll find a way to manage through that. And if you have good people, if you have good processes, uh, you rely on those to get you through those. and and be at the front of the, uh, the front of the room and, and be in that position to lead. And, but you have to take care of yourself too, as a leader in those environments. I mean, you're dealing with the same things everybody else is. Yeah. And, and so, but yeah, you have to you have to provide that direction, that positivity. Uh, people want to know what's going to happen. They want to they want to know if there's an end in sight. And and so you have to be honest with them, uh, but be forthright and and be that positive guidance as well. So. Uh, I think the environment continues to get more and more complicated, and you see that every day. And, and uh, I think I don't think anybody's untouched by that, uh, not just by what's going on within the industry, but all the external impact that it has in terms of uh, more recent events with George uh, Floyd and, mm -hmm. and uh, systemic racism and, and any number of things that we as an organization have to deal with uh, diversity. Uh, I mean, all those things start to come into play as leaders. We have to be able to address that, to respond to it, be sensitive to it, um, and and to help grow our organization and realize that we need to get better. So uh, it's not only the business piece, but it's the social impact that's going on around us that we have to be sensitive to. And as leaders, uh, we're challenged to do that. So uh, it's not an easy environment, right? Uh, where you're juggling a lot of things, right? Yeah, but to continue to grow the organization, but also be sensitive to the needs of the people and help us get better and grow our knowledge base and, and understand the bias that exists within uh, our society, but also with other firms and how can we get better. So uh, any number of challenges that we're trying to, to face and, and wind our way through. But uh, if you have good people and continue to focus on that, uh, you'll, you'll find a way. Hmm. Well, I'm glad we have great people like you and in, in leadership positions that are leading us through some of those challenges. So, um, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, Steve, uh, I, I don't think you're on too much on social media, but uh, if somebody resonated with something, I'm not on Twitter. No, uh, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't think so. I, I hadn't seen you on Twitter. I hadn't seen you on Instagram. <laughs> is uh, is there a, a easy way for people to reach out and get connected with you if they resonated with something that you said today? Yeah, LinkedIn is is. I mean, I, I go on and visit that page periodically and, and okay. uh, have contacts through there. So uh, that's probably the easiest way I would say if, if there's interest or you want to reach out. Okay, perfect. Yep, cool. And we'll put uh, a link to your LinkedIn and the show notes there for anyone that's looking for it. Okay. Uh, my final question for you, Steve, is looking back, knowing what you know now, uh, what advice do you wish you could give your 20-year-old self? <laughs> uh, you know, really, I, I, I don't have any regrets. Uh, I wouldn't say if, if I would do anything differently. Um, you know, one of the things when I first started out um, in, in college, I, I, I'll, I'll admit to this, I almost flunked out of college my first year. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, now you do. Now everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> if there's something I could have done differently, no, I, I really, you know, through high school, I was, 
I was president of the class, National Honor Society, sport, you know, everything came pretty easy for me. And I got to college and, and I, I was devoted to having a good time uh, and not so much going to class. And so uh, my father, my old man told me, uh, gave me a great lesson, uh, said, you know, if, if you don't care about school, then, uh, then I'm not going to pay for it. So you, you, you get a job and pay for it. So I did. Um, talk about a lesson learned. If I'd done something differently, uh, I would have devoted myself more uh, to the curriculum. But I, I pulled myself back, and, and uh, that was a great learning lesson for me. Uh, so I think if, um, if there's a word of advice or I would give it to myself, um, maybe you veer off the path a little bit, but know where you want to go, or at least have an idea, idea and dedicate yourself to that. Uh, I say this all the time, too, especially with uh, our internship program, which has taken a step back, unfortunately, this year because of COVID, but we'll continue to grow that. Um, uh, I see great promise uh, in young people uh, in our industry and what they can bring to us. And uh, my advice to them is, is to uh, go out, dedicate yourself to your profession, uh, do your job as best you can. And, and you know what? Uh, people will come calling. They'll, mm. they'll, they'll recognize those efforts. And you'll have an opportunity to advance your career in anywhere you want to go. So um, that would be my advice, I guess, to my 20-year-old self. Uh, way, 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 way back. <laughs> uh, it's kind of learning from those things. And, and uh, I guess that's one of the things. If you can learn from the mistakes of others and avoid them, uh, that's a good thing. So, uh, uh, but yeah, that's, that, that would be the one thing, I guess. Well, I think that's a great piece of advice and a great piece, uh, a great place to end our conversation today. Steve, I appreciate you coming into the sandbox and um, I'm looking forward to continuing conversations with you in the future. Great. Well, thanks for having me, Justin. Appreciate it. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. If this episode brought value to you, share it with a friend and show love on social. You can tag me at Justin Lee Peters. The link to the show notes is in the episode description and we'll include all the resources we talked about today. This episode was produced by Gabby Dimeke. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time in the sandbox.